All right, y'all, welcome to today's overview on Colossians chapter 3 and 4. You should have reviewed Colossians chapter 1 and 2 with Pastor Gavin. We're just going to go and finish off this book here. Now we're going to go straight into Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 through 25. And if you don't know me, my name is Brian Trujillo. I'm blessed to be the youth pastor here at the Way World Outreach. We're going to go verse by verse, dive in a little uh, deep into maybe what that verse meant. I learned a lot reviewing this for myself, and I know you will learn a lot too. It gives us a greater revelation of what the word means. And instead of just being another book, it comes to life and it gives us history and it gives us insight onto what these disciples actually meant and even how they were feeling. So let's go ahead and jump in on Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. It says the realities of heaven, not the possibilities of heaven. And because we know that Jesus is really raised from the dead, then our identity with him becomes real. It is only because we were raised with Christ that we can seek those things which are above. We've been raised to a new life with him, not just in him, but with Christ. Christ. And because we were raised with Christ, we should act just as Jesus did when he was resurrected. For example, after his resurrection, Jesus left the tomb. So should we. We don't live there anymore. After his resurrection, Jesus spent his remaining time being with him and being with and ministering to his disciples. So should we live our lives to be with and to serve one another and to build disciples who make disciples. After his resurrection, Jesus lived in supernatural power with the ability to do impossible things. So should we, with the power and the enabling of the Holy Spirit. After his resurrection, Jesus looked forward to heaven, knowing he would soon enough ascend there, and so should we, recognizing that our citizenship is really in heaven. Let's go to verse 2. It says, Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Earthly things are not all evil. But some of them are. Even the things that are so harmless in themselves become harmful if permitted to take place that should be reserved for the things above. It's just getting our perspective and our thoughts of heaven. In heaven, there's no sickness. In heaven, there's no poverty. It's getting our mind the way Jesus' mind is. He sees no limits and he wants our thoughts to be like the thoughts in heaven heaven because we're really citizens of heaven. Verse number three, for you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. We died to our own will and our own way in the same way Jesus died to his own will and he really took on the will of the Father for purpose and that's the same thing we should be doing is taking on will that is ultimately purpose and that's the Father's will. Verse number four, And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. We will share in all his glory. That means some of us may say music is life, sports are life, or I live for work. Of the Christian, it should simply just be said, Jesus Christ is life. And we are in covenant with Jesus, as our pastor has been teaching us. His children and the glory that awaits Christ is also awaiting us. Let's go to verse 5. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you, within us, right? Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Now, this isn't just a list of things rules not to do, but it is a list of things not to do, right? It's If we don't understand the spiritual understanding of why to do things, we'll just take it as I can't do things. God is simply trying to protect us and tell us, don't do it. At, it's best for you not to do it. I'm your father. I know these things, right? Now, um, it suggests that we're not simply to suppress or control evil acts and attitudes, It literally says we are to wipe them out. 
completely exterminate them, eradicate them, eradicate that old way of life. And to gratify any sensual appetite is to give it the very food and nourishment by which it lives, thrives, and is even active in our lives. Verse 6 says, And because of those sins that we just talked about, the anger of God is coming. The sins mentioned previously are part of the way that the world lives and not the way Jesus lives. So every Christian is faced with the question, Who will I identify with? the world, or with Jesus. And the anger of God is a consequence to a life living in sin. Verse 7, you used to do these things when your life was still part of this world. I used to do those things when my life was part of this world, when my citizenship was of this world. But when I got a new visa, a new citizenship card, I had to change my life. I had to live the way heaven lives, right? These sins mark a world in rebellion against God, but they are in the past tense for a Christian, for you and I. A true Christian, we cannot be comfortable with habitual sin. I had a teenager told me, he said, man, I I tried going back to smoking weed and I just couldn't do it. I just, I tried it. I just, I felt so uncomfortable. I said, that's how I know the Holy Spirit lives in you. Because there was a time where you were just able to do it and not feel convicted, wasn't there? Yeah, I I just didn't care. But now I can't do it. It's because the Holy Spirit is convicting us. Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And we should be comfortable with habitual sin. That's a sign that we are a Christian. Verse number eight. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Each of these sins are primarily committed by what we say. When Paul calls the believer to a deeper obedience, he tells us to bridle or control our tongue. It's also one of the fruits of the Spirit Spirit is self-control. Verse 9, don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Isn't it funny how lying is connected to our sinful nature? So when we lie, we're walking in a sinful nature. A lie is a complete manipulation or distortion of the truth. And we are supposed to walk fully in the truth. And truth has a name. And His name is Jesus. And when we lie, we are speaking contradictions of Christ. Verse 10 it says to put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. Like changing a set of clothes. We can almost picture a person taking off the old and putting on the new nature in Jesus. Except this time, let's not wear that old shirt again. I've got a new set of attire, and this is what I'm gonna wear now. I don't. I dress differently now. I have new clothes. I have a that. Uh, it's like seeing a picture of you from ten years ago. I couldn't believe I used to dress that way, right? We should think of that as I can't believe I used to walk and talk and do those things. As an unbeliever, we used to do things that I'm like, I can't believe I used to do that. But now we have a new way of living and a new attire. Praise God. Verse 11, in this new life, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave, or free. Christ is all that matters, and He lives in all of us. This new life is part of a family, which favors no race, nationality, class, culture, or ethnicity, It only favors Jesus because in this new family, Christ is all and in all. Praise God. Verse 12, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself. There we go. These are things we have to put on every day. Just like clothing. We have to put on new clothing, fresh new clothing every day. All these things we have to put on. It's a choice for us to put these things on daily. Here we go. Let's jump right back into it. Um, You must clothe yourself with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. This means that God has chosen the Christian, you and I, chosen us to be something special in His plan. Each of the qualities mentioned in this passage express themselves in relationships. A significant measure of our Christian life is found simply in how we treat people and the quality of our relationships with Him. Very important, the fruit of how we treat people will show that we have clothed ourselves with Christ. Verse 13, 
make allowance for each other's faults. Give a little extra, right? And forgive anyone who offends you. It, offenses will come. I tell people all the time, it's not if they come, it's will they come, right? When they come, it's one thing to get offended. It's another thing to stay offended. That's a choice now. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. That's tough, right? The Lord forgave us, so he's saying it's a commandment. It's not just a suggestion. It's a commandment. You must forgive others. We must forgive others. I've had a difficulty forgiving my father, forgiving certain people in my life. But I knew that if Christ could forgive me, I must forgive others, right? Forgiving them doesn't mean what, what they did is okay. It just means it's allowing that pain and that hurt to be gone from our lives now. Understanding the way Jesus forgave us will always make us more generous with forgiveness and never less generous. Verse 14, above all, clothe yourselves with love. There it is. We're putting more clothes on, right? We put our shoes on. We put our undershirt on. All we're doing is putting our uh, uh, t-shirt on. And uh, uh, love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Love is the summary of all the things described in this passage. It's really the trench coat that covers everything on us. Love covers a multitude of sin. It's the last piece of clothing that we have to cover ourselves with is love. It's the greatest thing that protects us against all other things. Verse 15, And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. An inward peace and also a peace that characterizes God's people, how we should all be living in peace with each other. It ultimately loves from having peace within us that will extend to having peace surrounding us. Verse 16, let the message about Christ and all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. Now, when Christ fills our life and we realize we're a beautiful creation, it creates spontaneous worship filled with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And in no specific order, simply just to worship Jesus. Verse 17, And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. This is more than being an ambassador of a company. We are to represent Christ in everything we do, everywhere we go. Some people could say, well, if I work for a company, I have to follow policy when I'm in the building, when I'm working, when I'm on hours, right? But when I leave, I'm good to be whoever I want. For the Christian, it's not so. You don't act a Christian only in church. We're Christ and we're followers and Christians and ambassadors of Christ everywhere. Outside of church, in our homes, within our marriages, inside our own rooms, in our private places, with our families, we are ambassadors everywhere. We do not clock out. We're clocked in and that's forever, right? We'll get our inheritance in heaven, our paycheck in heaven. But until we make it to heaven, we're on the clock. Now, um, uh, verse 17 uh, continues to say, giving thanks to him through God and the Father. Now here we're going to go in a little bit of a, a different direction. Instructions to Christian households. Verse number 18, which this is a popular scripture, but I'm going to give a little bit of an in-depth to make us all comfortable. Wives, submit to your husbands, as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. This has really been taken out of context so many times, right? Wives really being uneasy, and it's understandable, and husbands using this as the only scripture they've memorized in some cases. This is not to be demanded. The idea of submission doesn't have anything to do with someone being smarter or better or more talented. It has to do with a God-appointed order. If the family is a team, well, then the husband is simply the captain of that team. Verse number 19 says that husbands love your wives and never treat them harshly. If we want to say verse 18, we got to say verse, num verse 19 together, right? The verb shows that the submission is to be voluntary. The wife's submission is never to be forced on her by a demanding husband. How easy it is for a wife to submit to a husband who loves her, never treats her harshly, and is himself submitted to Christ. And all the women say, Amen. 
Verse 20 says, Children, always obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. This is a tough scripture for teenagers or children. It was definitely tough for me. I had a hard time uh, 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 understanding how honoring and submitting to my parents and obeying my parents was really ultimately obeying Christ. Paul has in mind children who are still in their parents for the scriptures, uh, still in their household and under their authority. When a child respects his parents' authority, he is respecting God's order of authority and in other areas of life. When a child is grown and out of his parents' household, well, they're no longer under that same obligation of obedience, but the obligation to honor your father and mother remains. Verse number 21, fathers, do not aggravate your children or they will become discouraged. Children have a responsibility to obey, yes, but parents, we, I have children, have a responsibility to not provoke our children. Parents can provoke their children by being too harsh, too demanding, too controlling, unforgiving, or just plain angry. This harshness can be expressed through words, through actions, or through nonverbal communication. But Paul wisely reminds us that the bad behavior may actually be provoked by us, the parent. Verse number 22, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear of the Lord. More than half of the people seen on the streets of the great cities of the Roman world were really seen as slaves. And this was the status of the majority of professional people, such as teachers, doctors, as well as uh, uh, menials and craftsmen. These are paid employees and not the past American slaves that we may know from our history books. This is a different slave. 23, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. We're always tempted to work just as hard as we have to, thinking we only have to please man. We only have to please our boss as long as this gets noticed by my superiors. But God wants every worker to see that ultimately they work for Him. When I serve in ministry, I don't necessarily do it to serve in ministry to please our leaders. I'm ultimately serving Christ. This is ultimately His church anyways, right? Verse number 24, remember that the Lord gave you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. The reference of an inheritance is clearly to the life of the age to come in heaven. Verse number 25, if you do what is wrong, you will be paid back for the wrong you have done, for God is no favorites. doesn't mean that we don't have favor with God. It's just we will reap what we sow, right? When a Christian worker does poorly in his job, he should not expect special leniency from his boss, especially if his boss is a Christian. Being a Christian should make us more responsible, not less responsible. All right, so that was chapter 3. Um.